Okay, today we're exploring the still more history of the atom, and we're going to look at how they developed the idea of electronic orbitals. When Niels Bohr described the atom, his model described an electron in orbit around the nucleus at a distance of 53 picometers. So we saw earlier on that, that that's not possible based on what we know from classical physics. We cannot have a, an electron going in a perfectly circular orbit around, around the neutron, I mean around the proton, because that would result in the, in the emission of electromagnetic wave due to the acceleration of a charged particle. So they had to refine the idea, and this came about when Schrodinger's wave equation calculated that the electrons could actually, could actually occupy areas of high and low probability in the area of the nucleus. In the Schrodinger wave equation, there are four variables, each of which represent a different aspect of the electron's motion or the shape of the motion. These four variables are represented by four letters, n, l, m sub l, and m sub s. n is known as the principal quantum number, and it describes the size of the orbital. And remember, these, are, these letters represent numbers that are solutions to the Schrodinger wave equation, meaning if you plug these numbers in, you get, uh, you get answers that make sense. And the principal quantum number then describes areas that are further and further away from the atom as the number gets bigger. That's called the principal quantum number, it has the letter n. The next number is the azimuthal quantum number, and it's represented by the lowercase letter l. And the, this uh, number describes the shape of the orbital and has a value which is n minus 1. So if n has a value of 2, then L has a value of 1, or it could also have a value of 0, but it has to be less than n. It's always at least 1 less than n. The M sub L magnetic quantum number describes the orientation of the orbitals and has a value that is either plus or minus the value of L. So if L has a value of 2, then M sub L can be minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, or 2. That gives you five possibilities. And when, in fact, when L is equal to 2, M sub L gives you those five possibilities. That's why we have five D orbitals, which I draw later on. I'll show you. And finally, there's M sub S. This is the magnetic spin. And it describes the spin of the electrons, which can be plus 1 half or minus 1 half. That's what it represents. So each electron in an atom must have four numbers describing its position in the electron. I love to use the analogy of a bus. The bus would be the atom. And when you get on to the bus, uh, you'll find a seat on the bus. If, there, if the bus is empty, you'll sit wherever you want to sit. You'll sit in, the, that, in what represents your favorite seat. Your favorite seat would represent the lowest energy level. The electron will always go to the lowest energy it can find within an atom. And then as the bus starts to fill up, more and more people get on. They're not going to sit next to each other. They'll sit somewhere where, they're, where there's free space. And then once the, when the, once the bus starts to get full, then people start to pair up. They'll sit next to each other if they have to, but they'll sort of pull their arms in closer together. They spin pair, as it were. They don't want to sit too close together. People don't like to touch each other on the bus. And you would find it odd that if the bus was empty, the same somebody came and sat right next to you on an empty bus. You would find that strange, right? Well, electrons are the same way. They're antisocial. They don't like to sit together, uh, so they will sit as far apart as they can. The, all these concepts have a name. We're going to learn about the Pauli exclusion principle, Hund's rule, and the Aufbau principle in the, in the later, uh, later part of the lecture. Okay, so any energy level can contain 2 times n squared electrons. So whatever the principal quantum number that you're looking at, uh, raise that principal quantum number by the power of 2 and multiply by 2. That's how many electrons that shell can hold. So if your principal quantum number is 1, you can hold up to 2 electrons in the whole shell. If the principal quantum number is 2, that shell can hold up to 8 electrons. If the principal quantum number is 3, you can get up to 18 electrons in that shell. Moving on, uh, the azimuthal numbers, which are represented by the letter L, the second principal quantum number, are also represented by letters harken back to spectroscopic terminology. Uh, we see S, P, D, and F, which should ring a bell for those of you who've already studied the periodic table. 
there's S block, P block, D block, and F block. We see that the periodic table is organized along the lines of these, uh, these orbital considerations. S used to stand for sharp, P for principal, D for diffuse, and F for fundamental. So these are all spectroscopic terms. I'm not sure exactly how uh, applicable they are, but that's where these SPD, SPD and F come from. Now, if the value of L is 1, then you get S as your uh, azimuthal. And that's how it's represented when we draw the electron configuration. If the value of L is 2, you can have S or P. If it's 3, you have S, P, or D. And if it's 4, it's S, P, D, or F. And you'll see that the electron content of each shell is limited by the number of possible geometric um, orientations it has. A spherical shell only has one orientation, so there's only two electrons uh, that can occupy it. P orbitals ha can have an X orientation, a Y orientation, or a Z orientation, so they can hold si a maximum of six electrons. D shells, which I drew here, have five different possibilities. You see the DX squared minus Y squared orbital, the DZ squared, the DXY, the DXZ, and the DYZ. So they're each arranged in different uh, um, geometries on the coordinate plane. They all look like lemniscates except for the DZ squared, which is a combination of a lemniscate with a toroid. Looks like a donut near a, uh, a lemniscate. The P orbitals are all lemniscates arranged along the X, Y, and Z axis. When you draw your X, Y, Z axis, by the way, you draw your across, that's the X and the Y, that's normal. That's the normal Cartesian coordinate uh, way of uh, doing two-dimensional um, lines. But when you want to draw the z, you just make it out of 45 to the y and the x, sort of kind of coming, it up, coming out at you in perspective. And then you label it from 9 o'clock. Starting at 9 o'clock, you go x, y, z. So we go on to the next board. So we'll see there's the px, py, and pz orbitals. They're, it's as though they're shish kebab by the very one, various one of the uh, coordinate plane axes. So the px orbital lies along the px uh, axis. The py orbital lies on the py axis and so on. Sometimes, like in the d orbitals, they lie in between the axes. The f orbitals are even more complicated to draw, so I didn't draw them. But uh, there's seven different types, which means the f orbitals will hold up to 14 electrons. Each electron has four numbers. No two electrons within the same atom can have the same numbers. And we, that, that idea is called the Pauli exclusion principle. Meaning that if you have two electrons, think again of our bus analogy. People are sitting on the bus. You'll never see two people sitting on the same seat. Unless, well, maybe it could be boyfriend and girlfriend. But let's pretend none of that's happening. Okay? You'll never see two electrons occupying the same exact spot in the atom. They cannot have the same four quantum numbers because that would mean they're occupying the same space. Electrons will fill the lower energy levels first. Okay, So you always take the most favorite seat on the bus that you can find. If the bus is empty, you have your, your pick of the seats. Electrons will always fall to the lowest energy level, level that's available. That's called the Aufbau principle. You, you, uh, the atom fills from the lowest energy level to the higher energy levels. Uh, the, the atom will fill up incrementally from the lowest energy levels to the highest. That's called the Aufbau principle. Electrons will not spin pair until all available degenerate orbitals have one electron, which is a fancy way of saying uh, they won't stay in the same orbital unless there's no other place to go. So again, if the bus is half filled, then you have no place to go except to sit next to somebody else if you want to sit on the bus. And electrons do the same thing. They won't spin pair until they have to. That's called Hund's rule. So there's three rules. The Pauli exclusion principle, the Aufbau principle, and Hund's rule. We'll recap. Pauli exclusion, flexible, uh, exclusion principle. All the electrons have four different numbers within any given atom. Aufbau principle, the atom fills from the bottom up. Lowest energy levels first, higher energy levels later. Hund's rule, electrons don't spin pair until they have to. So if you have, say, a P, a P orbital, because there's a px, a py, and a pz, the x will fill, will get one electron, then the y will get one electron, then the z will get one electron. When all three of the p orbitals have an, have an electron, then you'll get another electron in px where they'll spin pair. Then you'll have two electrons in px and a single electron in py and z. 
the word degenerate was used, and I didn't define it. Degenerate orbitals that differ only in orientation are termed uh, degenerate. They have the same energy level. Okay, so the px, y, and z orbitals, they have the same energy levels. They only have a difference in orientation in space. One's x, one's y, one's z. They all have, they have equal energies. The only way you can give them different energies is by putting the atom in a magnetic field. You distort the orbitals and you create a slight difference in energy levels. That's why it splits the spectrum into three peaks, or rather into three lines rather instead of the one line. That's what we call the Zeeman effect. The anomalous Zeeman effect is explained by the fact that um, the electrons are also spin paired sometimes. So when they're spin paired, that creates another slight difference in energy, which is harder to detect because it's a smaller one. And it gives rise to the last two quantum numbers are visible with the uh, Zeeman effect, m sub l and m sub s. The next thing we're going to look at is how to uh, fill in the electron shells that result from the combination of, all, of these four numbers that are the, the answers to the Schrodinger wave equation. And I made a mnemonic for filling the energy levels in the atom. What you do is you draw the numbers 1 through 8, and you put an S next to each one. Then on the tier above it, you skip the first two numbers and you start at two, and you number two to seven. And you put a P next to every number. Then you skip another two numbers and you number from three to six, and you put a D next to each number, and you skip again two, and you start at four, and you put an F next to each number. So it makes a nice wedge shape that is easy to remember. I know there are no eight S electrons, but it helps to preserve the pattern so it's easier to remember. If there were 8s electrons, they would appear, this would be 8s1, right under francium, 8s2 would be right under radium, but those elements don't exist or haven't been discovered. Uh, then what you do is you put arrows to show how 1s connects to 2s, 2s, the bottom of 2s connects to 2p, and that's the pattern, that's the normal filling pattern. You'll see there are tiny exceptions to the rule I mentioned in, one, in the notes early on, that uh, there is overlap between 3D and 4S levels. They're about the same, almost the same energy. And there's also overlap between 5S, 4D, and 4F levels. And you'll see sometimes that electrons will do that. They'll go into one level instead of the other, and they'll slightly break the pattern. And it's usually pretty easy to predict where, when that's going to happen. One of the rules you would want to use to predict when the, when the electrons won't fill that pattern, follow that pattern is when you can have two half-filled levels instead of one filled and one partial level. And we'll see an example of that with molybdenum. But let's do an easy example first. I ask, what is the configuration of hydrogen? Hydrogen has one proton, and therefore, if it's a neutral hydrogen atom, we'll also have one electron. So the lowest energy level that's available is the 1s level. The maximum number of electrons the level can hold is two. So the configuration of hydrogen will be 1s with one electron. So you put a superscripted 1 next to the s. So it's 1s1. Let's look at helium. Helium has two protons, and a neutral helium atom will also have two electrons. Therefore, its configuration will be 1s2. Now the s orbital is filled. With lithium, there are three protons, and a neutral lithium atom will therefore have three electrons. So the, configura the configuration, we follow the pattern, we fill the 1s level, and we're going to start the 2s level, so we get 1s2, 2s1. With nitrogen, nitrogen has seven protons and seven electrons. If it's neutral, it's going to fill, again, follow the pattern, 1s2, 2s2, and then the next level is 2p. Uh, it's going to have three electrons in the p level, so the total number of electrons is 2 plus 2 plus 3, seven electrons. There's the configuration of nitrogen when it's in the ground state. Now let's look at a bigger atom like calcium. Calcium has 20 protons, and a neutral calcium atom would also have 20 electrons. Let's follow the pattern. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Next thing will be 3s, so that 3s2 is filled. Then if we go to 3p6, that's also going to be filled. The lotus calcium is on a periodic table in which block? What block is this? S block. So everything that's in S block is going to end in S something. Alkaline metals end in S1. Alkaline earth metals end in S2. 
uh, Sky Layak, which would be group three, should end up in D1. It'll be S2, D1, they're all D1. If you go to the, uh, is that visible now? Or am I missing? If you look at P block, P1, P2, P3, P4, P5, P6, the most enviable electron configuration would be a P6 configuration. All the noble gases at P6. When fluorine takes on a negative charge, it gets an extra electron. It goes from P5 to P6. That's why fluoride is a stable anion. When oxygen gains two electrons, it also becomes P6, and that's why oxygen takes on a negative two charge. When nitrogen takes on three electrons, it goes from P3 to P6, and therefore nitride is a stable anion with a P6 configuration. So let's go back now and look at molybdenum. Uh, molybdenum, uh, molybdenum has 42 protons, and therefore neutral molybdenum will have 42 electrons. Let's look at the configuration. We'll follow the pattern, and we'll fill in all the electrons for molybdenum. But we'll see later on that the, it breaks the pattern a little bit. So it goes 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2. 4s2 would bring us down to 1, 2, 3, 4, s2. Calcium. 4s2 should be calcium. But we're not done. We have to go to 42. So we keep on going. 3d10 traverses the whole d block. 4p6 traverses the p block. 5s2 brings us down to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Strontium. Okay, now molybdenum is four more away. So we're going to say 1, 2, 3, 4. It should be d4. 5s2, 4d4. In fact, it's not 5s2, 4d4. Because what happens is as I said earlier, sometimes atoms prefer to have half-filled shells. So if you take an electron out of S and put it in D, you'll have a half-filled D shell, because the maximum is 10 for D shells, and it'll be 5. And it'll also be a half-filled S shell. So 5S1, 4D5 is the actual configuration of molybdenum. And we'll see that they're in the periodic table, that happens on a pretty regular basis in the... In the um, Transition elements, it also happens in some galanthinides and actinides. Okay, so uh, we'll, we'll use this mnemonic. Normally what we'll do is we'll fill up the shell uh, following the regular pattern. If we see that in the last couple of shells we have a situation where something is about to be half filled, then we'll sometimes we'll be able to predict that that's exactly what's going to happen. An electron will be promoted to the overlapping shell so that you get two half filled shells instead of one filled and one incomplete.